morning. I'm a little bit daunted by the uh, introduction that's been given. Uh, so it's only downhill from here. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank the Institute for the opportunity to uh, come along and address the conference today. Um, about one year ago, I spoke at the Institute's uh, economic group on this topic, and, and on that occasion, I presented a long series of slides with lots of acronyms and jargon, and uh, I believe it went down well, but I want to make you very uh, comforted this morning. I'm not going to go through that again. Uh, I'm going to leave that for others. And instead, I see my role here this morning more as kind of the, the warm-up act to tee up some of the issues uh, on the governance piece to, to give you a couple of observations, comments from where I see things, and, and hopefully issues that will be then echoed or picked up during the course of the morning. And once I believe I've that done, I can sit down and hand over to those that will do the real heavy lifting of going into the meat of the complex issues. Or at least that's how I'm going to see, I'm going to take the next 15 or so minutes. So in preparing for today, um, rather than having the slideshow, I sort of felt that I'd structure my comments around a, a, a couple of issues. To begin with, I thought I would just touch on the issue of the context, the background, I think, to where we come from in terms of the European economic governance. Then I'd like to sort of just give you a sense of, you know, maybe how it's working or, or, or where we're at. Then maybe to touch on some relevant challenges. And I, I know there are loads. So I've only just highlighted a couple, so it's, it's not seen as a, a complete or anyway sort of a comprehensive list. And then I'd like to say just a few uh, words about the, your dimension of the economic governance from both the European and the Irish context. So then in terms of background, I suppose what we can all say is that the... The last six years have demonstrated uh, to all of us that the economic governance framework within the EU and the Eurozone was not sufficiently robust, and it certainly didn't give us adequate warning for the member countries or the institutions. I think we can say that the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact were not enough, uh, or we weren't at least focusing on, on the right indicators with sufficient weighting. Um, in terms of the Lisbon process, we certainly it wasn't sufficiently grounded to alert the Union or the Member States to take actions to address the very significant loss in competitiveness that occurred in many Member States. And I think the SGP w was not designed to take account of macroeconomic imbalances uh, that we all know were growing up throughout the Union. On top of these deficiencies, I think the SGP was not always adhered to. And we also know that it was diluted, certainly in the middle part of the last decade, when certain countries ran into difficulties. I also believe that at the beginning of the crisis, perhaps maybe too much time was spent seeing the problem as an issue for the periphery or certain countries, rather than recognizing it as a crisis facing us all. And furthermore, I believe that we failed to see the interconnectedness of events throughout the Union. The so-called negative feedback loops weren't always recognized, or if they were not sufficient energy and action was taken to address them. We just didn't see the implications of the actions of one member state on the ripple effect it would have on, on other member states. And this has clearly been magnified in the, in, in the monetary union. So the experience of recent years has reminded us forcefully that we operate in a world of macroeconomic spillovers. And due weight was not given to this crucial fact while we were designing the original version of the monetary union. So for the past number of years then, uh, in the European policymakers, we've been trying to put out the fires of the crisis and at the same time rebuild uh, a better governance regime, recognising that we're not starting from a blank canvas. So the EU institutions and the member states have been in the process of retrofitting the system. And I think like all refurbs, it's not always ideal. But I think we've done a lot, but we're not complete. And I think, you know, sometimes within Europe and the Eurozone, we don't get always credit from our critics for what we have done. That said, when you look at what we have done, I'll, I'll be frank with you and say that I don't care for some of the, the labels that we use. We don't make it easy. Uh, the EU semester, the two-pack surveillance for Euro area member states, the macroeconomic imbalances, the scoreboard, the medium-term budgetary objectives, the six-pack, the CSRs, along with the fiscal compact treaty. They're just to name check a few, and it's actually quite difficult to actually say them out loud without stumbling up or, or mixing th them up. But when you stand back from all of this detail, and I've only name checked uh, some of them, 
I believe that we have a more robust framework for the EU governance toolkit. I'm not going to say to you that, it, that it's all perfect and job done. I think far from it. I think it's still work in progress. And no doubt the EU, your area, will at some point in the future be tested again and then we'll really know whether uh, we've, we've got it right. But taking that context into account, I suppose the question then is, is the governance regime working and will it be sufficient next time? So, like any Irish person that's asked a question, I'm now not going to answer it. Uh, instead, I'll point to the fact that it's probably a little bit like the French Revolution. It's probably way too early to say. But I guess a number of the speakers this morning in various aspects from looking down through the programme and down the various papers, I think they're going to be posing questions and maybe saying yes or maybe saying there's deficiencies. And I think that would be a, a good debate. For my part, I'd just like to remind you that we're developing the governance rules at a time when many countries, both within the EU and specifically your area member states, are still in excessive deficit. I mean, for instance, in 2010, all but three member states, Estonia, Sweden and Luxembourg, were in excessive deficit, so deficits greater than the 3%. We now have 16 member countries in EDP, and we're about to open proceedings in Croatia. Uh, so we're a long way from the steady state or the calm waters. So it seems to me that we're still testing the rules when most of us are either in bad times and some are in dire times. So how the rules will work in good times and how they'll help us keep us out of trouble in the future will be a much more important test, but it's, I think, some way off. However, at this early stage, what I can say is that I believe that we are seeing member states already beginning to change behaviour. Many are making a virtue of the difficult and hard tasks of repairing their deficits and debt positions. I mean, last week, the French finance minister, Pierre Muscovici, writing in the Financial Times said, and I quote, one can be French and take fiscal consolidation seriously. There is no contradiction between being a social democrat and being fully committed to restoring competitiveness. I think we can take a lot of other countless examples of where policy make makers are bringing the change government regime, <coughs> governance regime into the wider agenda, or at least they're certainly paying some service to it, whether it's lip service or not. I think the proof will be in the pudding. In terms of challenges, um, I believe there's a significant number of ahead of us facing us in relation to when we discuss the, the governance regime. I'm just going to name check a, a few and just talk about them. I, as I say, don't see them as being a comprehensive list. Because I fear we might be here for some time if I did. Um, the democratic accountability, I think, is a challenge. And by this I mean, you know, have we done enough to strong understanding within society of what these rules are and what are needed. And I think an event like this is certainly very helpful in terms of the Irish context in that. But certainly sometimes sitting at meetings in Brussels, I, I wonder have we socialised the rules amongst us all sitting at the table and we're the experts. So I think there's a big challenge in terms of showing to our people that having rules and monitoring the key indicators, whether they be wage developments, various macro imbalances, high debt levels, etc., that monitoring these is a good thing. Having policy makers take action to address imbalances for the good of, the all, of all, I think, is important. And I suppose when I talk about democratic accountability, buried in the back of my mind are various documents, which I'm sure uh, ye all have, have read and are familiar, but ones like the Commission's blueprint towards a deeper and genuine EMU, the European Parliament's report with a similar title, the Van Rompuy Four Presidents Report, all of these dating from 2012, which kind of sort of set out interesting roadmaps and posed challenges. And I think there's certainly anyone that wants to dig a bit deeper into this certainly worth a reread. Another challenge I think that we see is, is the whole question of the austerity versus the growth debate. And this view, I think, is one or the other is often put forward in terms of that it's if you have strict budgetary rules, then you won't have growth. I think addressing this issue is a really big challenge. I believe for some member states, there is some fiscal space to provide some support at the moment within the Union. Perhaps further operation of the imbalance procedures that we now have will prod action in, in these quarters. However, for, certain, for most member states, I think 
it isn't credible to have a long-term growth policy that is based on high debt and deficits or just making them worse. So absence of fiscal responsibility, it's going to be hard to see where countries will really enhance their growth prospects over the medium to longer term. I think this is a difficult message, but I think it's a sensible message. Another challenge, then, is where will the growth come from? I think during the ongoing period of fiscal and financial repair in Europe, answering this question is a really fundamental challenge but we better have some answers or else we, we risk undermining the whole new governance regime. Um, here I think the answer must lie in structural reforms, targeting focused policies aimed at tackling issues of low growth and the very high unemployment, particularly youth and long-term unemployment that we see in member countries. So I think there's a job of work there and I think issues like the CSRs and looking at country specific recommendations will be important. Then another challenge that just signpost here this morning, as I would see, is what I'd call the variable geometry that's going on within the European Union. By this, I mean that during the crisis, we've seen various pieces of evidence of a multi-speed Europe. We've seen Europe operating at some number less than the 27 or now the 28. The fiscal compact is a clear example of this, when we couldn't get 27 at the time, and I think we ended up at 25. Uh, then we have the euro area versus the EU, the so-called ins-outs, 18 versus 28. Then there's often the talk of the north-south divide that we see in Europe. And also in the context of this, we talk about programme countries versus non-programme countries. And of course, then there's the issue of the treaty institutions, the so-called community method, as opposed to the intergovernmental method. Something I note, Catherine Day, Secretary General of the, of the Commission, spoke about at this institute la, la, last week. But whatever Europe is, and by this I mean that the 28, it is varied and complex. And while there's key strengths, it also presents a major challenge that is highly relevant to the success of this governance project. So parallel with these challenges, I believe there are many within the Commission, and I think we got a little hint of this from Catherine last week, that are becoming increasingly cognizant of the fact that different circumstances apply to, to different member states. For example, the MIP process, the nature of the imbalances vary across member states. For this process to be effective, we will have to increase the focus at EU level on peer reviews so that member states can learn best practice from each other and take actions as needs be. This will take time. And I think, frankly, to date, most member states generally focus only on their own issues and surprisingly don't often take the wider view when you see it at the table in, in, in Brussels. Now, I'm not naive. I don't expect small member countries to take on larger ones. But this, I think, is where we see the, the role of the institutions and common principles coming into being. Otherwise, I think, again, the governance regime will fall short. Um, I think turning then to maybe... The final part of what I wanted to just say to you this morning was, I think if we look at the implications of the governance regime for the EU, your area, and in particular Ireland, I think it is clear implications for the EU 28 is that there will be greater macroeconomic surveillance. And I think that's no bad thing. The EU semester is now in its fourth year. Now I know that you'll all be familiar with the various timelines involved, and if not, I'm confident that some of my fellow speakers will remind us of, of some of that detail during the course of the morning. But I see the semester evolving over time, and in this context, I hope we will become more sophisticated in terms of focusing on material and important issues within the union, and not too focused on a one-size-fits-all type of policy prescription. I think what I have in mind there is, is that if country X has six country-specific recommendations, every other country has as well. It kind of becomes like a bit of a Christmas tree that we hang the baubles out of rather than focusing on what are the, the important issues. So I, so I believe that we'll see a stronger commission focusing on the governance package that it has at its disposal. And I think one immediate implication of that is, is that I see that we will see over time maybe uh, a bit more of the teeth of the commission and, and, and this is something that, that, that we'll so we'll just have to watch because we do know in the original SGP there was eventually when you got down through the articles fines. So this time around I think things are set up more for sanctions and, and a bit more coercion. Now apart from the envisaged stronger role that the Commission has, I think there's a greater role involvement for the European Parliament. 
And where that will take us is, I think, is, is difficult to predict. And I certainly think that the makeup of the new parliament later this year will have an important development in this regard. For the euro area, the crisis has provided evidence of the negative impact of spillovers for the participating countries. We are experiencing a greater level of oversight, and we've now already moved to a common budgetary timeline. As you know, all within the euro area have to submit their draft budgets by 15th of October, and then following an opportunity by the Commission to provide policy directions, all countries are required to have their budgets enacted by the end of December. In the euro area, we've also Additional requirements now for the role of independent fiscal councils and an independently verified economic forecasts. So of immediate impact for Ireland was to move away from the December budget. However, now that we've exited the bailout programme without a pre-arranged backstop, the so-called clean exit, we are now in post-programme surveillance, post-programme monitoring space. And this will continue until we see 75% of the funds borrowed from all EU sources repaid. So therefore, there will be a level of oversight involved from post-programme surveillance for some time. I think our expectations would be that, for all concerned, that this will work hand in hand with the other existing requirements and shouldn't be a duplication or over-complexity of the process. For Ireland, we have to deliver a deficit target of below 3% by 2015. The government is committed to do so, and in the context of delivered a budget for 2014 that sought to overachieve on its existing specific EDP targets for 2014. So I think we're nearing the end of the hard years and returning our public finances to the safe harbour of coming out of excessive deficit. However, once out of the corrective arm of the pact, we will then be moving into the preventative arm of the pact. Here we will see rules governing our achievement towards the medium-term budgetary objective or MTO and the applications of the, of the debt rule that 120th rule kick in. But I think in relation to certainly the, that issue, certainly I think growth should assist us in terms of the ratio uh, significantly, so it's, it's not austerity forever. So by way of some concluding comments, I think it's fair to say that our overall fiscal stance within the union will in future operate under stricter national and European role, rules than did in the past. However, this should be seen as a good thing, sensible approach, and not, as some would suggest, austerity forever. In se it is sensible in terms of ensuring that future growth will not be retarded by inappropriate fiscal policies, and that the growth in our, economic, in our economy generates a level of resources which should ensure that we build a more sustainable and sensible policy platform for the future. Our recent performance in the international debt mark markets is already proof of the merits of having sensible fiscal rules applied over a longer term focus. I would also argue that the EU governance regime has some additional advantages for a small open economy in that it bringing more stability and sustainability to the economic and budgetary policies across the euro area and minimizing negative spillover effects. So thus it is important to look at these developments not just from an insular or national perspective about how this affects us within our country, but also worthwhile looking at these developments from the perspective of how they help protect us from the potentially ne negative developments elsewhere and the opportunities they provide us by helping to put in place a more sustainable and stable Europe that should be to our advantage over the medium and longer term. So, in my attempt at answering that question I posed earlier, I think while it's too early to measure the success or otherwise of the new European government's regime, over the medium term I think two major tests will be, has the introduction and operation of such a robust regime fostered growth by focusing on the right policies? And secondly, has the framework become socialised within all of the member states? I think time will tell. Thanks for your attention.